Hello, I'm J.P. Detroit, president of the U.S. Columbarium and Fresh Pond Crematory. Uh, we've been here since 1884 with the oldest crematory in America, operating crematory in America. And um, behind me, you see the cremation chambers and the viewing room. Um, and also we're a columbarium uh, where we keep the cremated remains, um, which contain over 16,000 niches, okay? With over 40,000 cremated remains. Um, and our mission statement is to uh, not only perform the cremation, which we do on a daily basis, but to educate the public that there is a need to have a final disposition of those remains, whether it be scattered or whether it be buried in a plot or placed in a niche. Very, very important. Well, I'm so glad to have you with us today for a conversation about cremation. So you're located in the New York City. Oh yes, I'm sorry. We're in Middle Village, Queens, which is one of the boroughs of New York City. And we're in the heart of city. Uh, you actually can see Manhattan skyline from one of our windows. Here. It's quite a beautiful view at night, especially. If you go on our Facebook, we do have a Facebook account, I have loads of pictures and videos and uh, tours of the place and articles, I wrote a couple of articles and news and news and newsletter we put out there. Mm -hmm. but when this crematory was founded, you said 1844? 1884. It 84. was built in 1884. It was interesting. It was built in stages. Okay. Um, the original building was 1884, which if you read in my newsletter, it blew down. <laughs> in 1894, they rebuilt. Yeah, I could. So, um, uh, so but it was started in 1884, and then they kept building, adding on, adding on. So it's like a time zone, okay? Uh, like for instance, um, the main building was 1884, but then they built in 1902, 1908. They kept adding on. The chapel, which you see in the background here, um, was built in 1910, okay? And the second building. If, if you're showing the video later on, you, that was built in 1904. And then the actual building that's in the front right now is 1929. They enclosed the original building with the old, a new building, okay? And you actually see the old roof in our attic. So it's, 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 it's a maze, <laughs> it's a maze. So I'm guessing that most people wouldn't connect that cremation actually has such a long history Oh, uh, because there probably weren't very many people getting cremated back in 1884. Well, you know, uh, there is a plaque. Um, you know, I go through this building and I ignore things like the stained glass. I, I, how beautiful. There's a plaque in there, Caswell. His name is Caswell. And he was the first person to actively formulate an organization to uh, educate people about cremation. And of course, then he was one of the founders of U.S. Cremation Company, Fresh Pond Crematory. Uh, yes, it was a challenge back then. It wasn't a common thing. Um, premature burial was a big thing at that time. And we would use that as a, <laughs> yeah, don't, you know, you don't want to be created. You don't want to be buried. You don't want to be buried alive. Yeah, horror, horror. yeah. We'll and make so, sure you're dead before we create. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, so they would use that as a, as a, uh, you know, thing. And in fact, we were a society. We had a cremation society, and I'm so mad. I found a card in one of the books, and I didn't keep it. I didn't take a picture of it. And it's a donor card. It says, "Do not bury me." As a part of the society. Cremate me. And I think I think in the beginning, if you belong to the society, you got a free cremation or you got a free niche or whatever, you know. Um, and uh, a lot of the stained glass windows you'll see in the video were donations from our families. The original, the original chapel, you have many old, old stained glass windows. Wow. So what a difference uh, a century or so makes. I mean, the cremation rate is now over 60%. Yes. Yeah, westwide, and yeah. Um, uh, just with this COVID pandemic, uh, it seems to have even pushed it higher. What are you seeing? It's 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 been a very very big challenge for us. I was working from home because uh, old. I won't say my age. No, I'm 72, uh, <laughs> but um, I was working from home, and believe it or not, um, I had an $800 cell bill. I didn't realize I had to help people try to get funeral directors. You couldn't get a funeral director. And if you read my article, there was a, a Japanese family that had a son here and friend was taking care of it. 
And within two weeks, I got her, got her someone to take care of it. And, and she wrote me a beautiful letter. He wrote me a beautiful letter. Thank you for your help. It made me feel good that I was able to facilitate that. And that's what I was doing at home. I was helping people. Um, but you know, with the pandemic, there was a memorial void created by it, okay? Uh, people did not have the opportunity, maybe they're gonna do it a year later, you know? Uh, they didn't have the opportunity to memorialize in any form away, okay? And I think that's key to any cremation uh, that you do something with the remains and memorialize it, scatter at sea, memorialize. You still, even if you scatter at sea, you can memorialize. We have a, a big painting with glass and can etch the name and dates and coordinates where the person was buried at sea, okay? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even that you can memorialize and remember, have a place to remember the person. Yeah. And we get hits all the time for research. I mean, you don't know how many hits we get. You know, they want to know where grandma is or grandpa is, not in the closet. And, and that is a big issue that people are finding cremated remains in closets, under beds, oh. on shelves. Can I, can I tell you a story? I got a call from a young lady from Texas, okay? She was a nurse and she finds the remains in the storage. She says, you're not gonna believe this. I said, what, you found remains? <laughs> I said, I didn't know. I said, yes, <laughs> you found remains. I know. And she, the owner didn't want them. I won't go into details, the history of it, but. Um, and so we looked at the record, we found that the husband was cremated here and he moved, the, he came, his body came up from Texas to here because he wanted to come back to New York first again before anything. And then we split the remains, here we're going to go to Jamaica, here we're going to go to Texas. So that being said, I don't know where she got it, but finally she finds the daughter and she's all oh, with a tear in her eye says, I thought I had them both. On the mantelpiece. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's how this took. So I thought I had them both. And and so uh, she's gonna, and guess what? The nurse, the lady, the daughter lives over down the block from the nurse. How about that? Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, you know, I gotta call her up because she was gonna meet with her, give her the remains. And I, I'm assuming they're gonna go to Jamaica. Uh, I guess it must've been half, you know. Uh, but, it, you know, you get these stories all the time. Uh, you find grandma under the bed. What do you do with them, you know? Um, my daughter puts it very, very eloquently. She says, you're going to keep it home? Yeah, but that's not permanent. Why? What do you mean? It's not permanent because you're not permanent, okay? And eventually something, you know, it should be done with them, okay? And I always tell families, you know, wait a year at most, okay? But then make a decision what you're going to do. And we get calls all the time for reformation and we're always educating them constantly. We in the industry are guilty, not me, but we generally are guilty uh, of not, you could say you could do this, but to encourage families. I've even suggested in my articles that funeral directors should call a family in a month or two later. If, you know, if there's no disposition, which 95% of the time it's to be decided, to call the family, um, you know, do you need, have you finalized the remains? We even take the opportunity after a month, we write to the family and we want to know what, you know, did, did you bury them? And people respond, oh, they would bury you. And that's important too, because we get families looking for grandma months, years, years, 10, 15, 20 years later. And that's important to them to know where grandma is. It, it's amazing. Well, and, and that's a challenge that you have with cremation that you don't have with a traditional burial. That's correct. That's the, correct. It's, the cremated remains, yeah, can sit in somebody's home. You, they can wander off. They can get stolen. Right. And, you know, I realized, too, you know, we worked with a group called Missing an America Project. So they are veterans that will take abandoned cremated remains of veterans, and they will bury them in a veteran cemetery. Okay. We did 86 we have about 1,800 abandoned here. We have a lot here. There, yeah, yeah, wow. we have a lot. So, um, so anyway, so they'll take them, and we have a big ceremony. You can go on. You, I'll send you a video. It's wonderful, wonderful service. They provide an urn. They provide a hearse. Uh, they have a big ceremony. We had two Civil War veterans and two Spanish American War veterans. It was a beautiful ceremony. But the second time around, I was a little bit more involved. Okay, and I'm looking at the records, 
and I'm seeing letters, you know, well, mom is too upset to do anything now. Da, 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 da. And I realized that cremation is immediate. It's an easy way out for many people because they don't have to face that grieving process. And it's put aside, you know, it's put a, it, it's in the back, okay? And they're deceiving themselves because you can't go forward into my belief anyway. You can't go forward in life until something is done with those remains, okay? It's left in limbo, it's left on the shelf, okay? Mm -hmm. And I, I talked to everybody, you know, I was talking to another, you know, well, yeah, I said, so what are you gonna do with them? I am always encouraging families to at least put it in writing because mm -hmm. you know, why leave a legacy to your heirs to do that? You know, I, it's, you know, it's oh, important. I'm, uh, I'm based in Albuquerque, New Mexico and okay. Sunset Memorial Park here started okay. something called Scatter Day where okay. they allow people who have cremated remains of people or pets, mm -hmm. they have a pet mm -hmm. ossuary Okay. Uh, to place those remains for free and they'll put a little uh, name right. plate, right. but then it gets them to the cemetery. It exactly. creates a connection with that right. family right. and it, and they found it to be enormously successful, but also the fact that when families brought those cremated remains, it was as if the, the death had just happened as they were placing those cremated remains in a final resting spot. Absolutely. You know, um, we have a set, we have a 501c3, Friends of Fresh Barn, who's, who's very active and, you know, donations we get and we have a benefactor. So we decided uh, about two years ago that all babies, we have a baby section, okay? Mm -hmm. All babies come for free. Friends of Fresh Barn pays for it because they go for free. Well, that was, you know, I don't know what vision, I have visions and it takes me to other avenues. I don't know why, but okay. So I found that, you know, when I made this section, my mom says to me, you had a brother after you. I did. Yeah. His name was Gerard. And those days, they don't make babies, they don't make babies come back. You know, they make them disappear. Mm -hmm. So I said to her, mom, I'll put his name up there. She came one day and she's tearing her eye and she said, thank you very much. You don't know what it meant to her, okay? Oh. 1954, 1950. Well, that opened up more doors. As they're telling the story, I had a stillborn, I had, and they made it disappear. Uh, oh, could you put her name up? Put her name up. Mm -hmm. But I started the baby section only because, well, I lost a child, so I know what it is to lose a child. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a lady come to me. She said she wants to buy an urn for a baby. I said, well, you know, there's not much. So buy an adult or your husband. So she did. She immediately started to cry. 20 years ago, she lost this child. Mm -hmm. So that told me there is a void created. Okay. And even stillborns, mm -hmm. stillborns. Now the hospitals are more in tune to this and they give the family a choice. And we get stillborns, we get, you know, um, babies and they're all welcome and even if they don't put them there the mere fact that we're offering it to them is is very important to us and I feel good I feel good they have that opportunity whether they, they want to and of course they have to come we want them to come and see it and you know and I had a lady too she had a baby there and she lost her husband it made me really feel good uh, so we moved the baby with the husband Oh, and nice. she says, I'm glad you're still here. <laughs> you know, because I, I took care. Yeah, how important, you yeah. know, because I took care of her baby. I did it in such a way that, you know, it made her feel good about it. And now I took care of her husband and she was glad and made me feel like a million dollars. And this is what makes it worth that, you know, how could you do this? Yeah, well, it makes it worth them helping people in their time of grief. Mm -hmm.